And Tulsi Gabbard is the only anti-interventionist candidate running right now, or at least one of the most vocal anti-interventionist and anti-militaristic candidates running right now. She's the only one standing up against the military-industrial complex and pushing back against America's regime change wars. But there's no question about it that the leadership of the Democratic Party is not supporting Bernie Sanders and also Tulsi Gabbard because both of them represent uh, a negative with respect to the military-industrial complex. Uh, and Tulsi knows firsthand what the true cost of these wars is because she's currently a major in the Army National Guard. She served in the Iraq War and she's seen the tragic theater of combat. In fact, one of the reasons why the DNC was able to cheat her out of the third debates is because she stopped campaigning and went to Indonesia to serve. She decided to serve after 9-11 and in 2004 got to Iraq. And once she was there, she realized that the war was a lie sold to the American people and the soldiers under the guise of national security and humanitarianism. Like so many people, we were there uh, to serve our country and, and believing the lie that we were all told that, hey, we've got to go to Iraq and topple Saddam Hussein, this brutal dictator, because he's working with Al Qaeda and they've got weapons of mass destruction and they're going to use them to attack us. I mean, that's the mission and the mindset that we went there. Uh, believing, mm -hmm. like again, like so many politicians in Washington, so many people in the country, right. uh, only to really realize that we were we were lied to, uh, and that we were betrayed. This really wasn't about going after Al Qaeda. This wasn't about fulfilling that mission of protecting the American people at all. It was a regime change war that was launched under the guise of of national security, under the guise of humanitarianism. And you know, nobody likes a sequel, especially when the original sucked real hard. Okay, I mean, the original had the lie of dead babies. Look, no one really likes dead baby jokes, okay? And when there are dead baby lies that led us into a regime change war for oil, that's, that's just bad form. You know, you just can't trust the guy that threw out the dead baby lies for, for, for a war for oil. You just, you just can't trust it anymore. Tulsi's push for financial responsibility came from speaking to the third party nationals that worked for Halliburton, which had taken the opportunity to brand themselves throughout the war. I mean, what war couldn't use a logo, right? I mean, Halliburton for Iraq 1 and 2, Nixon's face for Vietnam, and racism for the Civil War. But these third party nationals that were employed by Halliburton were only getting paid $500 a month. And seeing plastered all over our mm. camp this big emblem of KBR Halliburton. Oh, God, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. You saw it, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, every outhouse was, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everywhere, yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we're from Hawaii. We have, like, very diverse, you know, we have people from across the Pacific, Filipino, Chinese, Vietnamese, all kinds of people in our unit. And we started making friends with the... Mm -hmm. the what were called the third country nationals that mm -hmm. were hired by KBR Halliburton to come and do things like clean the outhouses or cook the meals in the chow hall. And uh, so we'd start to make friends with them and talk with them and, you know, go outside behind the tent, start cooking rice and sharing food and uh, just start asking, hey, how much are you guys making? You know, how are you being treated? Oh, it was outrageous, it right? It was outrageous yeah, yeah. to see. I mean, hearing, oh, I get paid $500 a month. Wow a month to work 12 hour days, six, seven days a week. How often do you get home to see your family? Maybe once a year, but probably every other year. Mm -hmm. And just knowing the billions, the billions of dollars these companies are making and really to have this indentured servitude, it just, it went to, well, this is the military industrial complex right. that they're really the ones who are profiting. Right. Tulsi's push for Medicare for all holding Wall Street accountable and reinstating Glass-Steagall comes from seeing these indentured servants of war profiteers and their reflection on the American people. I mean, Americans today are working two to three jobs. People are drowning in loans and debts and caught in the web of poverty. 
Meanwhile, Bush Jr. keeps making fucking watercolor paintings and macaroni art, and everybody fawns over it and gives him fucking galleries. Dick Cheney is amassing more human hearts, and John Bolton keeps twirling his mustache as if that is going to start the war in Iran. And all of these people are becoming richer than God themselves. Which, by the way, is like, that's not like an empty statement I'm making. Jesus was basically a beardy homeless guy hanging out with lepers and prostitutes. Krishna was a cow herder. Okay, Moses basically led a union protest and a strike that led a whole group of people into the desert. Then all of these stewards and versions of God seem to take the form of the working class and not a CEO. I mean, okay, sure, Rama was a king, but he gets exiled and has to go live in the woods, like in a shack, like a one-bedroom shack. Okay, so some of these rich politicians that invoke the name of God to get richer, richer or, or wage wars are really doing the work of, well, themselves and their addiction to greed. I know I just uh, brought up Glass-Steagall, and I'm sure there are some people that probably don't know what that is. Uh, this was a piece of legislation that was passed in 1933 that was meant to separate commercial and investment banking and uh, restore confidence in the American banking system. And in 1999, it was repealed just in time for Y2K to fuck all of us. And Y2K is my very cute nickname for Wall Street because they basically did what everybody was afraid the real Y2K was going to do and fuck all of us into the 1930s. But with Twitter this time, that way that way we get to like tweet about our poverty, you know? That's that's like a fun exciting thing that they gave us to do. It's just um this is a uh, this is my bread and water lunch today, you know? That's but it's like fun. It's like poverty became fun, you know, because because they still allowed us to have Twitter and and share our misery with each other. But the notion of how are we going to pay for it has been branded as a conservative issue. Which is a bizarre. reporter asked me this question literally just yesterday uh, after the New Hampshire Democratic Convention. Uh, she said, well, you know, you, she's talking about how I've made it a central focus of my campaign that we need to end these wasteful counterproductive wars, uh, work to end this new Cold War and arms race and redirect our taxpayer dollars that we've wasted for so long to the tune of tr $6 trillion since 9-11 alone, redirect those resources back here to serve the needs of our people, to take care of uh, the urgent concerns people have, whether it's health care, infrastructure, uh, education. Uh, and, and her point was, well, this sounds like a conservative message. I said, what are you talking about? Right. She said, well, you know, the conservative message of how do you pay for things? And I said, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what, Americans across this country are sick and tired of hearing from politicians and from their government that there's not enough money to make sure that kids in Flint, kids in Newark, kids in communities across this country can't have clean water to drink because the government can't make sure that that infrastructure ensures clean water. No. You know, they're sick and tired of hearing that, you know, levees are failing and there's massive flooding in rural Iowa that's ruining uh, farms for their entire year of crops. And they're told, well, you know what, sorry, there's just not enough money to make sure that this infrastructure is holding to keep you and your family safe. So this is not a conservative concern. This is an American concern. And it's a logical one. I mean, one of the questions we never want to actually ask is, how are we gonna pay to wage these wars or, or give more tax breaks to, to greedy corporations? How are we going to continue to afford Jake Tapper's fucking salary? How are we gonna pay for these endless lies? Oh, that's right, by revoking the rights of the American people. The question of payment of these plans starts by significantly reducing the astronomical military budget and making Jeff Bezos pay his taxes for like minimum one year. 